So far, the types of energy that we have quantified are the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy near the surface of the Earth. The sum of these two types of energy was called the total mechanical energy of the object. Recall that the change of the total mechanical energy is equal to the work done on the object by forces other than the gravitational force exerted by the Earth. As mentioned in the previous lecture, the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. It cannot be created, nor can it disappear. So when an object has a change of total mechanical energy, where does the energy go? Which form does it take? For example, a box initially sliding along a horizontal surface eventually comes to rest because of the work done by the kinetic friction force. To understand where the initial kinetic energy went, we have to recall that we have made an assumption to the effect that our objects were to be solid without shape and volume, i.e that they had no internal structure. This is an approximation that is in the way of our understanding of where the energy went. In fact, objects are made of lots of atoms for which we cannot follow their individual trajectories and pinpoint their individual velocities. Even when the object is at rest, the individual atoms in the solid are wiggling roughly on the spot. They have kinetic energy. They also have potential energy related to the forces within the object that are keeping the atoms together. The sum of all these internal kinetic energies and potential energies is called thermal energy. In our example with the moving box, the initial kinetic energy of the box led to an increase in thermal energy of the box and of the part of the floor that the box interacted with. So how do we quantify the change of thermal energy? At first, we will only focus on the change of the kinetic energies of the particles making up an object, not their potential energies. For example, our objects will not undergo chemical change or a change of phase such as going from solid to liquid. A quantity called temperature, labeled capital T, is related to the average kinetic energy of the particles within the object. Average is a key word here. Not all the particles have the same speed or the same mass, but the temperature of an object essentially increases as the average kinetic energy of its particles increases. An object with high average kinetic energy for its particles is said to be warm in comparison to an object with lower average kinetic energy. Let us take a hot object and bring it in contact with a comparatively cold object and assume that there are no energy contributions to these two objects from the rest of the universe. The more energetic particles in the hot object near the interface are now interacting with the less energetic particles of the cold object. Their interactions lead to the speeding up of some particles and the slowing down of others. The first law of thermodynamics is of no help to decide how the flow of energy goes. It only deals with the total of the energy, stating that it should stay constant. But there is a second law of thermodynamics. It states, in a fairly qualitative form, that for an isolated system of particles, it will evolve in time towards a greater state of disorder. For example, it is less orderly to have a mixture of particles than to have all the particles of one type on the left-hand side and all the particles of another type on the right-hand side. When the type has to do with the average kinetic energy, there is a higher probability that interactions between hot and cold objects result on average in a transfer of kinetic energy from the hot object towards the cold object. The temperature of the hot object drops as the average kinetic energy of its particles decreases while the temperature of the cold side increases because its particles are 
getting the kinetic energy that the hot side is losing. The process continues until both objects reach the same equilibrium temperature, the value in between the two initial temperatures. This means that the energy flows naturally from hot to cold. This change of energy between the hot and cold object is called heat. We still did not quantify the change of thermal energy. For that, we need to quantify temperature first. To get an instrument to measure temperature, we will use two features. First, we will use this tendency of objects in contact with each other to reach a thermal equilibrium. Essentially, we need our instrument to exchange energy with the object we are interested in until they both have the same temperature. The second feature involves a characteristic of material that is known to vary with temperature, such as the density. The change of density due to changes in temperature is called thermal expansion. Most material lower their density as the temperature increases. They do not all do it with the same rate. In 1724, Daniel Fahrenheit proposed a temperature scale that is still in use today. His thermometer consisted of a small amount of liquid mercury at the bottom of a very thin tube that was sealed. Being a thin column, the change in volume can be seen in the change of height of the mercury column. He marked the lowest height when the thermometer was in contact with a solution of melting ice water and ammonium chloride. The height of the mercury when in contact with an healthy human body was said to be exactly 96 degrees Fahrenheit. But why choose 96? It is because previous attempts by other researchers had shown that the temperature of melting pure water was one third of the human body temperature with this choice of condition for the zero of temperature. This would mean that the melting temperature of water would be happening at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, leaving a difference of 64 degrees Fahrenheit between the melting of water and the normal body temperature. This length of mercury column was then easily subdivided in degrees since 64 is a power of 2. With his thermometer calibrated in this fashion, Fahrenheit measured the boiling point of water to be 212 degrees Fahrenheit. In 1742, Anders Celsius proposed a temperature scale that used the melting and boiling points of water as the reference conditions and split the scale in 100 increments each increment representing a change of temperature of 1 degree Celsius. After a minor revision, the centigrade scale would look like this. Around 1776, the Fahrenheit scale was revised to also use the melting and boiling points of water as the reference conditions. These were defined as occurring exactly at 32 and 212 degrees Fahrenheit, respectively. Another temperature scale that is quite important in physics was proposed in 1848 by William Thomson, who will be later known as Lord Kelvin. The advantage of the new scale was that the zero of temperature was set when the object has no internal kinetic energy. The increment of that scale is a Kelvin, labeled capital K and an increment of 1 Kelvin is equal to an increment of 1 degree Celsius. With this new scale, the melting of water occurs roughly at 273 Kelvin, and the boiling point of water at 373 Kelvin. To end this saga of the temperature scales, I want to add that in 2019, the unit of measurement of temperature, the Kelvin, has been linked to a physical constant, just like the meter, the second, and the kilogram had been. The physical constant in question is the Boltzmann constant. You can see from the measurement units of this constant, which are joules per Kelvin, 
that this constant is involved in a relationship between energy and temperature. Let us finally quantify heat, which is the change of thermal energy of an object. The typical variable name for heat is capital Q. Since heat is a change of energy, it is a scalar, and the SI unit of measurement of heat is the joule. When an object has a change of average kinetic energy of its particles, it changes its temperature. The energy required to achieve a particular change in temperature is given by this relationship. Capital Q is the heat in joules. M is the mass of the object in kilograms. Delta capital T is the change in temperature that the object undergoes during a time interval delta small t. Delta capital T is negative when the object is cooling down and when Q does not depend on changes of potential energies of the particles. All that is left to explain is the variable label small c, which is known as the specific heat capacity of the material that the object is made of. The specific heat capacity is a constant that depends on the material of the object and its state. Its value is found experimentally. For example, the specific heat capacity of water is 4,187 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. For water in solid form, C is 2,093 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. But for water in vapor form, it is 2,000 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. In a previous lecture, we had defined another measurement unit for energy, the food calorie a measurement unit very much in use in the food industry. One food calorie was defined as being equal to 4,187 joules. This conversion factor might have seemed quite arbitrary at the time of its introduction, but knowing now that the specific heat capacity of liquid water is 4,187 joules per kilogram per Kelvin gives us a hint for the reason for the definition of the food calorie. Using the relation introduced in the previous slide, we find that the energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius is 4,187 joules, which is equal to one food calorie. This is the definition of a food calorie. Now would be a good time to give examples of numerical problems involving heat. However, it will be the subject of the next installment.